Thanks so much, Ross. We're starting with uh, a really dynamic panel. Uh, we have three speakers who are both distinguished researchers, but also individually highly effective as public intellectuals and as policy advisors. So we'll hear first from Professor Brian Schmidt, um, my colleague here at the ANU. Brian is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow um, and an astrophysicist. As this audience knows well, he's also the 2011 recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, but since then, he's had uh, deep engagement with um, public debate and policy formation in domains such as science, higher education and research. Brian uh, will be followed uh, by Professor Ian Chubb, who is Australia's Chief Scientist and a former Vice-Chancellor here at ANU uh, and also at Flinders University in South Australia. And then we'll round off the panel with remarks from uh, Professor Bruce Chapman, who is Professor of Economics here in the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU. He's also the architect of the Higher Education Contributions Scheme and a former principal advisor to Prime Minister Paul Keating. His more recent work with Tim Higgins and uh, Joe Stiglitz is on income contingent loans for social and economic policy reform. Uh, each of our uh, speakers will uh, make their remarks, uh, they promised me in less than 15 minutes, to uh, allow ample time for the conversation that follows. When we move to Q&A, uh, we'll invite uh, Michael back to the, the panel and uh, we'll uh, aim for uh, some really uh, engaged and, and dynamic discussion at that point. So I'll invite, first of all, uh, remarks from uh, Brian Schmidt. Thanks, Brian. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces from my perspective. So I'm really speaking from someone who has been thrown into the deep end and been able to see what happens when you suddenly get a set of opportunities. So in terms of influencing uh, decision makers in terms of policy, uh, the best advice I can give for you is to win a Nobel Prize. Right. <laughs> that, that has increased my ability to do things by probably about a factor of a million. I mean, it's not two, it's not five, it's a million. Uh, and I, I realize that and I take that, uh, you know, that's a responsibility I feel I have uh, to try to do it uh, as well as I can. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about you know, what I should do and looking abroad to people who I think have done it well. And uh, my experience is there's a few people who have done it very, very well. And um, people like uh, Stephen Chu and uh, Paul Nurse are the two obvious ones to my mind who I sort of have sat and talked to about what they've done because it seems to me that they've been extremely effective. So the first thing we need to think about is what is science policy, and it really breaks down to two specific things. One is science informing policy decisions on broader uh, discussions of the government, and that is uh, what uh, I think you primarily talked about. But for many of us, we spend our time trying to convince the government just to do more science, okay? And they're two very different things. One's an advocacy, for science, and the other is actually having science impact policy. And we, I won't say we confuse them, but we should be aware that there are two very different outcomes uh, there that we're trying to achieve. And I, in some sense, get to do both. Uh, there's also other things, informing education debate, where we do have um, some interest in that, and uh, the uh, overall economic debate of why science and R&D and, and policies around those are secondary to what we do, but they are also places where we may or may not have a point of view. So the first thing that I've learned is you really need to have a, it's a long game influencing policy. You're not gonna just step up one day and uh, successfully influence policy in a positive way. You may get lucky, and change policy, but then it will be one of these where the process did not work, and you will suddenly have influence. Uh, I would argue to all of you, 
don't go that way. That is the bad way to do things. That is where politics gets the wrong answer, and it may be the answer you want, but you have circumvented sensible policy uh, process to get what you think is best. And that is something you need to be uh, cognizant of. And when we all try to do that, uh, it just we just look like a rabble, and we do not have any uh, real influence. We just end up being pawns in a game that, quite frankly, very few of us uh, are very good at. That is, we really are the pawns. We're not the, the knights and the queen and the king. Uh, you also have to realize that because it's a long game, you're going to get opportunity. So my first opportunity in this space came when I was 27 years old, and I had, for whatever reason, made some discovery, not the accelerating universe, but I discovered something, an uh, exploding star on the other side of the universe, which is part of the thing that led up to accelerating universe. And the Today Show called me up and said, would you like to be on TV? And I'm like, when? Like, six in the morning, I'm like, okay. And then I got to immediately got off that and the age called me up and said, why don't you do a 1400 word op-ed? And I said, fine, when's it done? No, I do. And they said, 3 p.m. And I'm like, 1400 words, 3 p.m., geez, okay, I'll do my best. And so I did. And so those opportunities came when I was a nobody uh, to, to anyone and you do get a chance to start talking things. And people at the age remembered me so that when I did make a discovery a few years later, they said, why don't you write another op-ed? We kind of liked your last one. And those little opportunities build up. And you can make a decision yourself uh, to try to make opportunities by having a media presence. Some of my colleagues spend an awful lot of time having a media presence either by intentionally going in and having a, a presence on Twitter is a very common way that build up your reputation now. Write newspaper articles for the conversation to go through and, and slowly build up your presence. And, and that takes a lot of time and effort, and it takes years. Uh, and not everyone's gonna win at it, uh, but some people do. So you need to realize that uh, you will get unexpected opportunities, and you know, I did not know I was gonna win a Nobel Prize. Uh, they, they literally, they don't tell you in advance. Uh, there seems to be confusion there that, oh, well, you knew you were nominated. No, you don't know anything. They literally give you six minutes warning. So you have to be of a mindset to, to take advantage of those opportunities, and that's called thinking about it. My, my own view is as a scientist, you have, no matter who you are, a uh, responsibility of part of your work is to think about your place in society. And so when the opportunities come, you can meaningfully comment on it. Uh, you have to, in most cases, decide if you're going to be aligned or unaligned with a certain political sphere of, of, uh, of thought, okay? Now, most of us don't think of that. Of, I, I certainly play a middle game, a middle role. That is, I don't choose sides, I try to inform. That's the role I've decided to make. There are people who decide to be on one side of politics or another, but the decisions you make now, for example, when you're tweeting, that align you with the left or the right will be there forever. And you have to realize that you may have influence in certain circumstances then, but you will have long periods of not having any influence at all. You'll be able to chatter and uh, maybe kick up noise, but you won't actually have any influence on policy if you aligned yourself to the group that's not in. It's not clear to me that you have any more influence than the people who have taken the middle ground um, when your side is in. So it is a strategy. You need to be aware that what you do and say, and it's fine to have a, an opinion, but if you go out in public, uh, it will be remembered by a lot of people. And that's uh, the reality that's changed. It used to be people could forget because they couldn't go through the microfiche to figure out what you said in 1971 in some op-ed piece. But uh, Twitter, they just look up and say, what has Brian Schmidt said for the last uh, five years? And it's analyzed. And I realize this when I suddenly meet a political staffer and they'll say, oh, back in 2009 when you just joined, joined Twitter, you said, and I'm like, God, how much, you know, how many of my feeds did you go through? And the answer was the entire thing, okay? Uh, and so ultimately this comes down to the idea of the trusts and relationships you have with 
uh, policymakers. These could be the politicians, they can be the people in government. And if you are seen as being a reasonable person uh, who doesn't surprise them, uh, surprises do not make this sector happy. They really don't like surprises. And so they need to trust you. And that trust takes years. It takes years of being sensible, right? You can't just suddenly go sideways and tell a minister one thing one day and then come back and say, oh, you know, in the media, I've changed my mind. Uh, you know, that doesn't help you. It, 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 it is okay if you really do change your mind, but you don't want to be playing games. As a scientist, you are being consulted not because you're a politician. You're being consulted because they think you're an expert who can provide opinion. You need to really understand your sphere of influence. Now, I have a sphere of influence which is very different than four years ago. And it doesn't mean it's hopeless and you should just go home you know, with your bat and ball and not do anything. But you have to realize that when you are a young scientist, for example, you're going to have far more uh, success in influencing me and me influencing the decision makers than you influencing them yourself directly. Okay, and that's, that's a cold hard reality. But that's it's okay because I try myself not to do anything alone. I am always trying to essentially be a conduit to the scientific community. I do not, and I believe it is my responsibility absolutely not to, go forth and use my position of influence uh, in a way which is, does not have the broad consensus of the community. And so I'm very careful about that. So I actually want to listen to people. I want to get lots of ideas. This is a very important part of anything I do and say. And if I disagree with the consensus, then I keep my mouth shut because I have way too much influence on matters of science. And that is where we as scientists have a responsibility. Within our scientific community, we have a responsibility to fiercely fight for the contested ideas. But when it comes to media, I think we do not. I think we have a different responsibility, which is to strongly advocate consensus scientific bodies like the Academy to talk on our behalf. So next week, we're going to be talking about climate change. The uh, Academy will be releasing an updated report on what the science is behind uh, sci uh, science, and the science behind climate change. And for the small number of people in the community, scientists who do not agree with the consensus view that you know, climate change by, uh, caused by humans is happening, I would encourage them to be responsible to acknowledge the consensus and to say that although they disagree with it, that they feel they need to have that conversation within the confines of the scientific discipline. That is certainly, in my case, how I look at my responsibility, which is to have my discussions within the scientific community and then to talk about the consensus. If I feel I can't represent the consensus, I keep my mouth shut. And that's a responsibility I think we all have as scientists. We fail to realize even a young scientist coming out and providing a contrary opinion which no one in the readership can understand because it's based on the science you know, how much power you are wielding, but it's not positive power. You are breaking essentially down the power of science and allowing the politics to win out. And you may win your ideological battle, but when everyone does that, then science has no influence at all. We just look like people who can't provide any information. And that's one of the things that's happened specifically in the area of uh, climate change. And so when I talk about climate change next week, I'm not talking about what I believe. I talk about what the academy has stated. And there's a big difference there. Uh, we also have to realize as scientists that policy also involves ethics. It's not just the hard called fast. There's political judgment. And we have to, in my opinion, be very careful about specifying policy responses from the scientific understanding. Those are two different things. 
and I would say they are orthogonal in many respects. And as a scientist, if you go out and let's say, I say, climate change is happening, and then I say, and we need to go through and immediately pass a emissions trading scheme, you have just mixed two things that do not and should not be mixed by a scientist. It is okay to have a view on emissions trading scheme, but realize it's separate from your view on whether or not climate change is happening. There are many responses to climate change of which an emissions trading scheme is that what an economist might say is the best thing. But as a scientist, I think most of us aren't very well informed. And I you know, challenge most of the scientists to write down why, uh, in a mathematical formula, why that is the most efficient policy response. And I happen to be married to one, and I let her write down the equations. But in the end, we need to make sure we separate those things out if we want to continue to have broad influence. Finally, uh, policymakers and uh, the media, politicians, uh, they respond well to what I call triangulation. When I go out and I'm discussing uh, my take of media, uh, what we should be talking to the media, I confer with the Academy. I talk to Katrina. I talk to Ian. I talk to Bruce when I talk about uh, Hex and the influence of higher education reforms. I don't go out and just do it on my own. I make sure that we can triangulate. That is, they're getting the same answer from anyone who knows what's going on. And if I feel I'm really out in left field in that, then I'm stepping back. If it's an area of astronomy, then again, I will take it up with my astronomy community, but I will say that astronomy hasn't featured lar highly in uh, national discussions of uh, uh, policy uh, in general. Uh, and so that comes down to effectively that triangulation is a matter of consistency. Politicians are very scared when they're getting expert advice that's conflicting. And so sometimes there's conflicting advice and we need to be honest about that. But that should be the last resort. We as the experts need to talk amongst it, amongst ourselves as best we can. And that's why within science I think it's really important to involve the academy, use that as an expert advice. And it doesn't mean you just have to be an academician. The academy uses people from all areas of its, uh, uh, all areas of Australian science to help form its views. It's the academicians that hopefully give it the brand uh, that this is serious, but uh, everyone can and should be involved in that. So in the end, I think everyone has a role. You don't know when your role is going to become suddenly much larger, but informing the debate is the first thing, making sure that you, know, you are uh, knowledgeable about what's going on so that you can say something sensible, but know what the limits are. If you're going outside and giving your own views then, and that are, not, that are contrary to the bigger view within policy circles and in the media, then think what you're doing. And uh, I would say if I could give any advice to people, uh, that is some, one to think about. And I'll stop there. Many thanks, Brian. Ian, we'll go directly to you, please. Thanks, Ian's Monica. going to impose himself on the audience. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's not. He has to stand up to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he hasn't won a Nobel Prize, so. <laughs> but only because my children didn't get a vote. Otherwise, I would have been right. Um, Colleagues, and uh, there are many of you in this room who are a lot more experienced at this than me, um, and uh, about how you get advice into the right place and in the right form. Um, and, and my background is, is a little different from, uh, from Brian's, but obviously we overlap. And I listen with great interest to what he said and what Michael said, because they set the context for a lot of what I would say. Um, my background in this area goes back to when I was a young academic few years ago and um, we uh, were working out how to get more money into medical research. As a medical research scientist myself, this was a very important uh, uh, part of my life and a little group of, uh, uh, some would call it a ginger group, 
used to meet in these strange places, in, often in Melbourne, a few of them there, and uh, we would talk about how we could get to influence some of the decisions that would be made to support the health minister if the health minister was going in to argue for more money for the NHMRC, to work out how the NHMRC as a body and the medical research committee of the NHMRC could work together to make sure that we could present a good case. And we used to sit there for, for a lot of uh, many hours and, uh, and, and talk about these things on multiple occasions. And invariably it came back down to how do we get to Bob Hawke? And uh, the next question for a medical research community is, who's his uh, physician? And the next question is, what will we tell the physician to say when Bob Hawke hears the snap of the rubber glove? And uh, the, uh, you know, we used to plot and plan and do all sorts of things to try to get more money, and I think probably reasonably successfully, because if you look at the history of the support for medical research in this country, it has been... Uh, it's had its wobbles, but it's been generally uh, generally quite supportive. But the point is that it was my first um, initiation into constructing a case, developing a case to seek to influence outcomes in the directions that you would like to see, but it was lobbying. I uh, went on eventually to become a Vice-Chancellor, which are positions I held for 16 or so years. During that time, I was president of the Vice-Chancellor's Committee, that uh, august and powerful body, um, some might say. The, um, uh, and, and then I chaired the uh, group of eight within that period and so on. And we had to play two roles. And uh, Brian put his finger on them, but, but the two roles were advocacy. So we had to go in and advocate for a particular thing. Higher education, for the most part, uh, inevitably funding, just as they're doing now. Uh, but that was really what we did. But at the same time, uh, and this also goes uh, to a point that Brian was making, but, but we had to take the bigger view. There was no point in simply saying we want more money for higher education without contextualising that so that you could say that some of the consequences and what we would do for more money, what would we do in return for more money? And we were never very good at that. So it became more of an advocacy rather than, as it were, a, uh, a, a statesman-like role um, where we sort of talked about how higher education could help to make this country a better place in a deep and meaningful way, not the sort of superficial, well, it's better if you're educated than if you're not. That's probably true, but there has to be more to a case that you make to look for more support from government. So we went through that, you learn a lot, you learn a number of things which I'll elaborate in a moment. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what you look back on and what you, what you have to try to distinguish in, in, as far as I'm concerned, is means from ends. What were we trying to achieve and how did the bits that you needed to fit together fit together to enable you to get to the end game that you're trying to create? And I would say that that's still a gap in the way we discuss big policy issues in this country. If you look at the present debate about higher education, um, what are we trying to achieve here? How does it contribute? How will it contribute? What will it look like should all of the present proposals pass through? What would higher education look like in three or four years' time when it is only by then that we will know how the different bits, the different decisions taken in different universities around the country, only then will we know how they come together to give us a higher education system, which will be different from the one that we've got. Now, at the moment, I'm not advocating for or against. I do advocating on that one in private because it's not my role. But, but you just need to think about it. What is it that we're trying to achieve? It's not just about a cost saving. It is about a value. It is about issues of value. And it's an issue of balance. And, but it is, most importantly, in my view, seeing that higher education is a means to an end that is greater than just higher education on its own. And we've got to work our way through that much better than we have. Um, and then I took on this job, and uh, there's enough said about that. Um, <laughs> they, uh, but it's interesting. Um, and, you know, as you do, the older you get, the more often you're asked, you, you are asked, do you enjoy your job? 
and you've got to be careful not to pause before you say yes <laughs> because the, uh, the pause is a, a big qualifier. So, uh, but I do enjoy it. I do, um, uh, and, and as you would expect somebody like me from my back background, you enjoy it because you have the capacity to influence outcomes and you have enough uh, hubris perhaps to think that you can do it better than anybody else. So I could be treasurer, for example. Uh, oh. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I do enjoy it, and I do think uh, that it is, and I would only do it while I think that capacity to influence is there. And, and Brian made a number of points about trust and the relationships and things that you have with the um, constituency, which in a sense you represent, together with the people uh, to whom you have to represent that constituency. There is no point in just picking fights or trying to embarrass um, politicians or others if you're in a job like this because then you have no influence and you have to say, why would you do it at all if all you are is somebody who goes out there and gives a sort of glib, superficial, cliche, riddle driven response to some question from the media? If that's all you do, why do it? Well, some people might like that. I would not. So um, I think that I don't pause between do you like it and yes, because I do, but because I think it gives the opportunity to have influence and get better outcomes than you might otherwise uh, achieve or that somebody else might achieve. Um, when you look at science in public policy, then you will find uh, around the world there are uh, many different ways of configuring the re relationship between uh, scientists and uh, government. And I guess the message from that, rather than rehearse all the differences, and there are some governments that have positions like mine, the one that I hold, uh, there are other governments who do it differently, but the point is not so much the differences between us. It is the emphasis they put on good scientific advice into government and into policy making at an early stage. And I think Australia has had a chief scientist since, what, 1983 or thereabouts. Um, and, and, and we have been uh, part of that shift within uh, uh, the world. Um, we were probably early on in having a... Uh, a chief scientist or a chief scientist advisor, whatever they're called. Um, we did that. But when you look back at the effectiveness of some of those and you look at what's happened in different countries and the way different governments over many political colours have responded to the science advice they get, then what it comes back to is a, uh, uh, a culture, a real culture of mutual understanding and respect and it's trust it's, it's empathy, it's the advisor understanding what needs to be achieved, what can be achieved, what the limits are on what can be achieved. Because as I said, we could all dream. If I had a magic wand and a completely plain whiteboard, I would draw a different design for this country than the one that we presently have. But it mightn't be better because um, it, they are my views. But the point about it is that there is no point in saying to a government, this is what you've got to do, because I think it's the only way to move forward. And then when that becomes public, they're embarrassed, trust breaks down, influence falls, why do the job? Um, good policy processes, and I, Michael touched on it too, but good policy processes and, and good science has to have regard for the community. I think the days, if ever they existed, and I don't know whether they did or not, because I can't remember back that far, but, but, if, but if they did, that, that a scientist could do something and say, I'm doing this, I have an entitlement to do this because I've got a PhD. That entitles me to get public contribution to my life for the rest of my life to do whatever I want to do at the pace that I want to do it. And by the way, it's good for you because science is good. If those days ever existed, they don't now. And we have to find a different way of building trust within the community, much better than we have as a scientific community. And I could give you a lot of numbers that are here before me about, about the public's perception of science and scientists. And it's not rosy, it's not good. It's not as good as we would like it to be, but it's not as good as we need it to be. 
because at the end of the day, if we do good work and we do good science and we develop a lot of knowledge and we know how to apply that knowledge and how to use it properly and all of those sort of things, we have to remember a couple of things. If the public don't want it, it won't happen. If the public aren't influencing politicians to say, yes, we want this to happen, it won't happen. So we've got to work a lot more closely with the community, I think, than we ever have before and explain from the early days why we're doing what we're doing, what the implications of it might be, could be, should be, will be, and get to the point where they understand and we don't just drop it on them and say, you've got to change everything in your lives because we're now telling you what you're doing is dangerous. And I think climate change is an example of that. I don't think, I think we kept the debate within the scientific community for much too long. And it was only when it got to a certain point and it got out seriously on a big scale into the wider community that suddenly this meant dramatic changes. So it was easy for people to put the frighteners on. You only have to listen to some radio programs or read certain newspapers and see the frighteners are on on a regular basis. There is no science behind that frightening, or minimal if any, but it's easy. And it's easy because the public was not prepared by us as a scientific community to begin to understand how things were happening, what directions were being taken. Tony Blair, when he was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, once made a, gave a brilliant speech, well worthwhile, 2001, to the Royal Society. And in that speech he said, science allows us to do more, but it doesn't tell us whether doing more is right or wrong. And what he went on to say was that science needs a new compact with the community because it will be the community that will make a moral judgment about whether doing more is right or wrong. And that's really one of the critical points about science in policy. Because the loop, slightly different loop from Michael's, but the loop is that ultimately the political process will respond significantly, perhaps not exclusively, and it will try to lead uh, and all of those good things, but it will respond to the public view and public pressure. Oh, already. So I'm only 10% of the way through. <laughs> the, um, so let, let me say in the last three minutes, plus one, plus one um, that um, the, uh, one of the important things for us as a scientific community is to know your audience and to know it well. Remember that they're busy people and remember that because you're an expert in one area of science, that doesn't make you an expert in science. It makes, an expert, it makes you an expert in your field. So. As Brian said, you've got to actually, when, when you're in a position like the one he has at the moment, you've got to be able to represent more than your own expertise. But too many scientists extrapolate from being the best in the world at understanding the, the Drosophila genome to thinking that they actually understand how universities work. It doesn't follow, not by definition. It doesn't follow that they know how the policy process works. You've got to remember when you approach people that they're busy people. Um, I was talking to the uh, parliamentary secretary yesterday. Her list of responsibilities is a, a four-page long, ranging from the anti-dumping legislation to STEM. And you've got to attract the attention of these people. And you've got to be able to do it. And you've got to, as I, I think Brian said, you've got to be persistent, you've got to be patient, and you've got to keep going back. Too many in the science, to, science community think an op-ed piece that gets a spark of interest is all they have to do. That's not true, a spike is a spike. It's not actually changing the way people think on a longer term, it's a spike. And you can't just say, well, I'll do one and then I'll do another one in a year and then I'll explain this in a year. They're a series of spikes. You haven't shifted the perceptions. It requires courage because you've got to put yourself out there. It requires patience. It requires persistence. And above all, I think it requires passion. The um, um, APS has taken steps to ensure that science uh, is better embedded in the policy process. They produced an APS 200 project uh, a few years ago, three years ago or so, and that identified a number of things to do. They recommended that we should frame national priorities and within, within them we should set agency challenges. I support that view. We're in the process of doing something like that now. They talked about improving the science capability in the public sector. Well, I think that's a good idea. When I was looking at who heads up Commonwealth departments in Australia today, very eminent people, and I'm not criticising any of them, but only two of the 18 have any qualifications in science. So that's not necessarily or by definition a bad thing. 
but it does mean you've got to know your audience because you're not going in there and talking to somebody who understands how scientists think, how they work, how they don't have probability, all those things necessarily. These things have to be taken into account when you're making your contribution. Of the 150 members in the House of Representatives, there are nine who have a STEM qualification and have worked in a STEM role. There are five who have worked in a STEM role but don't have a STEM qualification, and there are two who haven't worked. Oh, no, that's not true. They have worked. Two have a STEM qualification but have not worked in a STEM role. I thought it said two haven't worked. Um, <laughs> of the um, 76 senators, 11 have a STEM qualification and have worked in a STEM role. So the audience that we deal with is not our peer group. It's not the people who understand what you say, who know your shorthand, who understand your shorthand, who understand the way you think and go about thinking about things. They understand when you're talking about whether or not the, the uh, rate of change in the universe is, is, is accelerating. Um, people you talk to in your peer group will understand what all that means. When you talk to people from those sorts of backgrounds, intelligent, smart, earnest, hardworking, very busy people, they need it explained to them in a way they can address and see the implications that go way beyond that. So it's putting it into that context that I, uh, uh, I think is in particularly important and we have to be relentless at it. We can't actually just say, oh, I did that, that's enough. As I said, it's a spike. Spikes are useful, but spikes actually have to change the threshold. They've got to build up to change the threshold of understanding both within the immediate audience we have for policy production and making and to, to decision makers, but also to the community at large. And when we get that uh, understanding right and get that balance right, then we will actually change the ball game and then we will make decisions about land use or ocean use or understanding what's happening in the oceans or the climate or to the um, um, biome or to the, to the climate. Um, all of those things we will understand much better than we do and people will have a much better understanding and the debate will be much more civilised, Michael, because it will be much better informed. Thank you. Well, having listened to and agreed completely with my esteemed colleagues about the lessons that they draw about the relationship between research and policy and dealing with our political masters and mistresses, uh, I, I've just got nothing to add. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me. The kind of lessons that uh, have already been drawn, I want to draw as, as well, but I'll do it through some telling of some anecdotes and they're almost entirely anecdotes against myself uh, as a, a total innocent in a world I did not understand. And when I tell you uh, these stories, I hope I be able to make clear the kind of lessons that I think we, really, that I learned. And let me assure you that if you want to learn a lesson really well, uh, screwing up is a great way to do it. <laughs> you will never forget. And the kind of lessons that I want to draw have been made before. But in summary, and before I tell you the stories, our universe is very different from the universe of policy making. What we do here at the Australian National University, for example, as researchers is almost, well, econometricians call it orthogonal, unrelated to what politics generally is all about. And it's completely critical to understand that. The second broad point is that the politics is all powerful. So even if you've got the evidence and you must have the evidence, and even if you have the arguments and you must have the arguments, and you've got particular perceptions and views about what the world might look like in your area, it may very well be totally irrelevant because it doesn't fit a political agenda or the views of a minister or a department or indeed an electoral cycle. Thirdly, whatever you've got to say, uh, remember that you're dealing, and, and Brian brought this out very clearly, you're dealing with people who don't know what you're talking about, generally. And you've got to be able to reduce what you think the main messages are into 
about two or three compelling sentences, and that's to convince not just them, but for them to use this as a process of promotion for reform and change in a media cycle which is obscene, uh, the simple um, and short. And you've also got to know your audience. And if you don't know your audience, you may as well not be there. So the stories that I'm going to tell are all about those themes. And just as background, I had two experiences directly as an academic in the uh, political world. They were both as advisors to cabinet ministers. One was John Dawkins, and he was minister essentially for education, and I was there from 1987 to 1989. And the second was in the office of Paul Keating when he was prime minister. I was there from 94 to 96. And uh, the first experience I had, which was pretty horribly quick, after I joined the staff of John Dawkins, I think it was the second meeting of the office preparing for question time. Now, people had told John Dawkins not to employ me because I was an okay economist, but more or less a political, um, how should I say it, uh, moron, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And this became absolutely clear the first day I was there because um, Part of question time was on that day. I hardly knew what that meant. Uh, and uh, the minister had organised for there to be a Dorothy Dixer. I hardly knew what that meant either. A Dorothy Dixer, as you ask, you all know this, I didn't really. You ask the minister to basically boast about what the government is doing. It's always a question from the government to the government. So someone at this first meeting said, here's a good one for us, minister. Why don't we have blah, blah, someone from some marginal seat always, uh, ask you how many poor single mothers are now enrolled in universities in Western Sydney that weren't there before uh, due to the brilliance of the policies of the university policies of the Labor government? And somebody said, well, Bruce should know the answer to that. And then I, and then I was asked directly, do you know the answer? Can you get the answer to that? And I said, yes. Uh, I should have added, if you give me six months. <laughs> and I didn't know that this was going to be needed at 2 p.m. <laughs> it was now 11.46. So uh, the old Parliament House was a mad place in space terms. Everyone was almost literally sitting on everyone else's head. So I basically camped out at ANU and then I would visit there when I was welcome and sometimes after this experience you'll understand I was not always uh, welcome. So I came back to the ANU and fiddled around and did a few things and maybe had lunch and when I came back to my office at 145 there were messages everywhere, go down to the House of Representatives immediately, call John Dawkins straight away. It looked like there was something urgent going on. Well, indeed, there was something quite urgent going on, which was that uh, uh, he was a bit unlucky, really, but John Dawkins needed this number. And actually, this number, I don't think, exists now. I reckon if you really, really tried, you might be able to get that number. But I certainly did not have it at 2 p.m. on that day. So they weren't able to head off the Dorothy Dixer in time, and he was very unlucky because it was the first one up. And so when the first question came, it was to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, the Honourable John Dawkins, and the question was, how many poor single mothers are there in the western suburbs of Sydney who are now at university because of the brilliance of this Labor government? To which John Dawkins said, for the first time in Australian political history, in answer to a Dorothy Dixer, I don't know. <laughs> and for the first and, I suspect, last time in political history, he said, I'd like to take that question on notice. <laughs> the opposition had a deeply wonderful time. Um, John, John Dawkins turned his back, not that he didn't speak to me, he would turn his back on me if I was uh, kind of in the vicinity. And he basically said to me, we won't, we, you, or I think he did this to frighten me, and he certainly did frighten me. You are going to come up with a way of reintroducing university fees in Australia, and I want you to go back to your place, ANU, and write an options paper. 
and then I'll see you in three months. And I think he was pretty pleased that it would be at least three months before he <laughs> would see me. So when I came back and we had this extraordinary uh, conversation, uh, to use a euphemism, in his office, <laughs> and I'd written an options paper. Of course, in an options paper, you get to basically say, this is kind of what the right option is, even if it's all disguised in cost benefit of this and blah, blah, blah. So he knew that I was particularly interested in and in favour of a pay later system, the pay when you can, which is now called HEX, it was an income contingent loan. So uh, in De on December the 8th, 1987, we had this conversation, just me and him, he seemed very happy when I arrived. Uh, he seemed extremely distressed when I left. <laughs> So he, read, he said, I've read your paper and it's pretty clear what you want. I have to ask you a few questions about this thing you call income contingent loan. And I said, yes, Minister, cheerfully. He said, will it work? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he said, well, how many other countries do it like this? And I said, well, well, well none. Uh, none, that I, none that I know of. Uh, he said, what will the students think about this? And I said, oh, they'll hate it. Uh, the students will hate it. It doesn't matter that they don't have to pay until they're doing okay, and it doesn't matter that if they're poor they, and they don't graduate they, and they never have to pay anything, they'll hate it because at the moment they don't pay anything. So there was a silence. In fact, the silence has got longer and longer. He said, well, what will the vice chancellors think about all this? And I said, uh, oh, they'll hate it because they're all old style lefties and they basically want the uh, abolition of fees introduced by Gough Whitlam to remain. He looked at me as if, uh, have you ever had a conversation with somebody when uh, after a little while you, you are sure they think you are a total moron? <laughs> uh, that's the way he looked at me. And then he asked me the killer question because what they needed was the money. They had queues and queues of unmet demand going into the system what they wanted was fees so that they could, they could actually supply the places. So then after an inordinately long time, I didn't seem to notice all any of this. He said, well, when do we get the money then? He's getting increasingly angry and talking between his teeth. And uh, I said, oh, what about, it's a pay later and only when you can system minister, so in about six or seven years. <laughs> So uh, that was a pretty big and horrible experience for me. Uh, not as bad as it was for him, I assure you. But why did this happen anyway? It happened because the politics mattered hugely. It happened because the left of the Labor Party were, uh, was so strongly in favour of Gough Whitlam as the great icon who had abolished fees in 1974. It didn't matter that it was an insurance system. It didn't matter that it was offered progressive uh, results. It didn't matter that it was equitable. It mattered because he had to win through the left of the Labor Party and because it was kind of soft and cuddly and looked fair and that was kind of enough. So that was a really important point. Just one more minute. Thank you. Uh, I wrote a speech for Paul Keating, which he didn't deliver, uh, two weeks before the uh, 1996 election. And I went to see him about 10 minutes before he was to deliver the speech, which was his normal pattern. And he was looking through the speech. He had a big blue pen and he was just going shh, 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 shh about all the words I'd written. He said to me, no offense, mate, but this is academic crap. Uh, to him, that was uh, kind of a tautology, I thought. Uh, <laughs> what, what he meant was, and he said it, he said, let me tell you something about Australian politics. It is black and it is white, and it is never blacker nor never whiter, one week out from an election. And all these qualifications on the one hand, this on the one hand, that is irrelevant. So. They're the lessons that I had. I know them very well. It's probably a bit sad that it's kind of late now that I know them. The different universes, we've got to get them. You've got to understand the institutions. The politics is all powerful. The message has to be simple. And um, you've really got to know when it comes to the detail, particularly dealing with a very professional bureaucracy, what you're talking about. So always be prepared for the tough questions, even if they don't come out simply in the media. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Bruce. We'll invite Michael back and uh, we now have ample time for, for conversation. I'll ask you to um, uh, identify yourself uh, and also indicate uh, to whom you'd like to address the question or the comment or whether it's addressed to the panel. Uh, we will um, recognise you in turn but also wait for the microphones. Up the back. Oh, hi, my name's Elijah Perry. I'm a lowly, lowly undergraduate uh, physics student at the University of Sydney, but I'm quite interested in the connection between science policy making and politics. My question is addressed to the panel, and it's about the broader question of engaging the wider public in the, if you like, values of science in order to, I suppose, set the grounds to make it easier for sort of scientifically based policy to be politically feasible. I'm wondering what the panel's view is on the best way to, if you like, go out into the suburbs and really persuade people who don't have time, you know, to really even look at the media lots, to really view science as a value that's worth, um, that's worth worthwhile in their life. And I'm wondering, is any, if we as, well, we, us as scientists were going to do that, aren't we bordering on political campaigning? And so I sort of wonder that although, yes, we're all scientists and we like throwing facts at people, really the art of persuasion is slightly different. And so surely maybe we can't get away from playing the political game out in the wider community. I'm just wondering what you guys think. Great question. Who'd like to kick off? Ian you, Ian, you spoke about community engagement. Let's, uh, let's start with you. Well, if, you, um, if I take the part of your question where you're talking about going in, out into the suburbs where people don't uh, have much time to look at the media and read the, well, do whatever they do to get information, then I think that uh, um, my view is that we as a community have to start early, we've got to start in our schools, we've got to engage with the parents, we've got to engage all the way through. And if you, if you take literally your comment about out in the suburbs, then I would go in through the schools um, and make sure that scientists are actually actively engaged with schools, real scientists, because in our primary schools, for example, it's widely known that we have very few specialist science teachers in our primary schools at a time when the young minds are at their, their most ready to be formed and some of, their, some of their parents likewise. Um, one of the startling things for me was I, I, I uh, opened a conference a couple of years ago at um, UNSW and it was for honours students and uh, graduate students in mathematics. And when he was, there were about 100 of them there, and when he was introducing me, the, um, the uh, MC said, uh, you know, just as a matter of interest, how many of you studied mathematics against the explicit, explicit wishes of your parents? and 75 of them put up their hands. Now, it, it really does, it, it highlighted to me the need to get to people in a very systematic, but sort of also um, uh, relentless way to explain the virtues and values of a lot of what we do. On the issue of whether it's political, I don't think it has to be political. I think, uh, I think, uh, um, the way that it should be done in those communities is that science is an issue that's of importance for this country like it is everywhere else. I mean, most of the rest of the developed world is moving ahead of us at the moment uh, and they're doing it in a planned and organised way uh, and a committed way by governments of, of multiple persuasions. I mean, a lot of the big policy developments in the UK and the US have, uh, have crossed uh, changes of government without particular change. Um, and uh, I think that we've just got to represent it as an important issue for the future of the country, that the level of science literacy has got to increase. That means getting to people early enough, often enough for them to have some understanding about how science works, its values, its ethics, um, the probabilities, all of those sorts of things. And, um, and we've just got to have people like you who are much closer to the age of some of those uh, people than I am um, to be engaged in the process too. So it involves, it requires all of us to be involved. Thanks. Other views? Uh, Bruce and uh, then we'll go to Brian. Let me say something uh, quickly about radio. 
Most journalists who will interview you about a topic know almost nothing about it. And that's because they have to cover so much. And what might seem obvious and clear to you as a researcher is often uh, completely foreign to uh, the journalists and to most of the audience. So you, you, start, you must start with the presumption that people don't know what you're on about. And it almost doesn't matter what the first question is. You, if you, you need a message, and the message has to be straightforward, not dishonest, but very simply put. And that message has to be in your head right at the beginning and in an understanding. Uh, the, the clarity and simplicity are everything. I don't think it's at all hard to be apolitical uh, in this process. You just talk about the topic you know uh, and talk as if you, you, you don't actually care about the outcome, although you might personally care hugely about the outcome, but you care about the evidence and the concepts and making them as simple as possible. Yeah, just to um, emphasize what uh, both speakers have said, that uh, going out, I think you need to have this really long process of education and, you know, the, we're paying the price now for the mistakes made 15 years ago. So we have to, you're not going to fix it overnight. Uh, the other thing to realize is that science is, in this country, not a uh, political issue. It's not that there is a side for and a side against. It's actually both sides see it as being less relevant than maybe we think it is. So I think going out and is not a, in advocating science at this point is not a political issue in this country. It's one of relevance and that does distinguish it from other areas. Ken Baldwin, Australian National University and former STA president. Uh, I've got a question about when the rubber hits the road, in other words, at the interface between science and policy. So we, uh, we, we heard about the naivety of scientists and researchers and that they need to be educated to understand the real politic of the, uh, of the world that we live in. Um, there's also a need, I think, for the other uh, facet to be looked at. So. Why is it that we have a lot of uh, activity around uh, science meets policy makers, science meets parliament, uh, training courses in CSIRO, universities on how to interface with uh, the political process, and yet we haven't put as much into the education of the scientific process amongst policy makers. And if that is uh, indeed true, uh, what are the best ways of achieving that understanding? In other words, to ensure that people engaged in policy understand what Brian talks about when he means the scientific consensus. That this is derived through uh, internal debate in the scientific community, it's through peer review, a whole range of processes that have been built up over hundreds of years to form uh, what we now know as the scientific method. So I guess my question is, how do we uh, ensure that this cultural uh, gap is bridged on both sides uh, by understanding the, uh, the world of science as well as understanding the world of politics. So a question for the panel. Michael? Yeah, look, um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question, but um, I th think it's important to pick up the point that Brian Schmidt just made in relation to the previous question. Most policy issues where science is involved are not contested. Um, you know, I, I gave the example of drug testing, for example. Uh, you know, they, re they rely pretty largely, the policy makers, the policy, you know, the decisions are made on the expert advice of people who know about drugs, uh, scientists who know about drugs. And you know, uh, I don't think there's a difficulty um, in that sort of case. And it seems true of a whole lot of safety issues in transport, et cetera. There's a, you know, an enormous reliance on scientific advice without understanding, if you like, the limitations to scientific advice. I think where it, it gets more difficult is when policymakers are asking for more than the scientific advice is capable of giving. That is, 
well, when I'm talking about prediction, and uh, if you like, how the invention will be used. Uh, it's, you know, uh, we just don't know that. But even in that case, where they'd like greater certainty than science is capable of providing, for good or for ill, they'll probably uh, take more notice of, their, of the, what I'll call the guesses of scientists about how an invention will be used, how fast it'll be adopted, etc. They'll take more notice of that than they will of me. Um, so I think you know, we should recognise that for the most part the system works. Um, <coughs> Thanks. Other, other where comments? it gets, con you know, as what I tried to say is where it gets difficult is where it's contested. And it's often not contested because of the science, it's contested because of, you know, the implications of the decision for various different groups. So, uh, you know, there's a widespread consensus on climate change. The reason why it's contested is what we should do about it. And why, why is that contested? It's contested because some people think it'll damage their interests. Yes, I, I'm, sh I'm sure what you're saying is absolutely true. But then, on the other hand, why do policymakers cherry pick the scientific evidence and ask specific people without looking at the broad consensus <coughs> and take a sort of an adversarial view of the world where you've got an argument on one side that's got equal weight to an argument on the other side when actually the scientific consensus says it's all on this particular side. So, so there's these issues about how the scientific process works that perhaps aren't fully understood, or if they are understood, they're uh, deliberately ignored when it comes to the political process. I, I guess my response is I don't think they do cherry pick the scientific advice uh, for most of the scientific advice. I'm not saying, uh, I think, you know, even on climate change, both sides of politics accept that we, <coughs> that there is man-made climate change. That's why both sides have signed up to a target. Uh, now, once, you know, when we talk about the next target, there are, there are legitimately a range of considerations of a non-scientific nature in setting the next target, not least what other countries are doing. <laughs> other, other comments from the panel? Well, I'll just make a little one. I think, I think it also goes down to um, expert advice versus commentary. And, and the, uh, one of the things that you see with um, climate science, for example, is that it, it is true from those who are expert in climate science and have spent their lives studying the climate with all its complexity and everything else, um, they, uh, it, it doesn't take too much uh, of a contrary view, um, usually, well, sometimes from people with a scientific background, um, to rock that boat. And it depends then on the political process, and I think that that it, that it is. I mean, Michael's essentially correct, but we do see where um, the uh, the evidence is. Um, uh, for, so far as the public domain is concerned, that evidence is cherry picked, and it is put out as if it were equal. There's a demand for equal space in newspapers and airtime on TV and so on. When you're talking about 97 to three or whatever ratio it is. Um, and, uh, and I think that we do have to be careful about how we represent it. And it is, it is a question of, uh, uh, Michael's also correct, that, that the political process will more often want us to be more definite than we know we can be. We then fall into the trap of qualifying everything, frequently over-qualifying it, which leaves the door open for the alternatives. When in fact what we're really saying is there's a 99% chance that this is happening. Um, and, uh, and, and it, goes, it goes into a variety of areas. I mean, Michael was right about drugs and, and pharmaceuticals, um, but, you know, there's a little flurry of activity on around the world right now about vaccination. Um, and uh, you will argue that the science for that is, uh, you know, predominantly on one side. Um, but there are people who dispute that. And they get airtime, and they get space, and and uh, they're they're allowed to do that. I mean, you know, in our democracy, people are allowed to put forward alternative views. Uh, the question then is how you bring to bear the weight of evidence and, and demonstrate to people that that in terms of our probabilities, there is an extremely high probability that vaccinations have had 
done good for humanity. And, uh, and we need to make sure that those mes the messages are not lost in the noise. Bruce, you want to come just in? Just quickly, it's, it's not just about information. Uh, because of ideologies and different value systems, being fully informed does not necessarily lead you to one answer. And let me give you a really good example in my head. The economics of, of climate change. There are costs and there are benefits of an emissions trading system and a carbon tax or direct action. And you, if you want one particular scheme to work in your political favour and you might be kind of uh, wanting, leaning towards one particular area, you can identify the timing of the costs and benefits and they're quite different. You can't actually intervene in the issue of global warming without it costing. So then the question becomes a really hard one and can be easily suited to the political preferences of whoever wants to make the argument. A carbon tax costs. Do you want to have a very different planet in 50 years time or 30 years time? And are you prepared to do the trade-off between the present and the future? That depends often on an ethical judgment which may suit people and they might be quite disparate across different ideologies. So it's not as if it's as simple as if only they knew the, the data, there will always be costs and benefits and so they can, the weight that they give that, particularly the timing of uh, the costs and the benefits can be completely critical and nothing that you can control. Thanks. I'm going to move us on. Uh, we have a question over here and then we'll go over here and if we have time to use it. Thank you. Uh, Walter Reinhardt from the Fenner School at ANU here. Uh, perhaps Professor Chubb and Professor Chapman could talk a little bit more about um, science into policy making across partisan lines but also across government levels and uh, be taking this panel a little bit beyond science to the highest levels of government. Well, <clears throat> I can say something which is a bit uh, pertinent to the current debate and higher education reform. And when I saw the budget, I mean, I was completely uh, surprised, is a euphemism, about the radicalness of the government's suggested changes to higher education funding. And my, but my response was not, as somebody who kind of knew the area, was to go instantly go to the media and say, this is, these bits are really un uh, unfair and these bits won't work or this bit seems to have an argument. But it was to sit down with my close colleague Tim Higgins and to model it properly. The questions were really clearly defined by the budget. They hadn't been that clearly defined and we'd never gone into that space because we thought it was so radical and would not happen. So that was months of work on the, it was essentially about the interest rate issue for Hex, which both Tim and I and most economists had looked at this knew that the hex interest rate chosen at the time, all those years ago, was to protect the disadvantage. So the debt would never go up in real terms if you were poor. And 25% of people don't graduate. They will be poor over their lifetimes compared to the average graduate. So it wasn't a shock horror, this is, this is unacceptable, blah, blah. Let's look at the data and to show the cases scientifically in, a, in an economic sense uh, as we could and to argue the case always on the basis of the evidence which was defined by the clarity of what the budget wanted. So you ha we had to reflect in a different environment, but because we didn't present it in any sense a, pl a political way, I thought it became quite potent because it was evidence-based and, um, uh, and I think that that's a, a really critical point is reserve your judgment until you're really sure about what you're talking about, and in the end we, we were, and then make the message fairly simple. Well, I don't know what I can add to that. Okay. Uh, do you want to give me a little bit of your question so that I can respond? So, science into policy making, science into uh, government across partisan lines, for both opposition and the current government today, but also, I mean, the Australian government is not the only government in Australia. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> the last bit, especially. Is there a chief scientist in Yes. And there is one for every state and territory. 
and uh, we meet uh, two or three times a year. And um, uh, we, we talk to each other about what's happening in the states and territories. The overwhelming um, supporter of science and technology in Australia is the Commonwealth Government. It spends about $9.2 billion a year, um, not counting what it goes into higher education through, uh, through some of the, the, particularly the Commonwealth Grant Scheme. So that adds a few billion. So it's a, it's a big contributor. Um, the, uh, but one of the things that we have to do, so if I go back to education system, I mean, we're in the interesting position where the states and territories are responsible for schools. Uh, the university, the, the, the Commonwealth is responsible for supporting the universities. Therefore, pre-service teacher education and the big employers of that are the states and territories, of those graduates are the states and territories. So they've got to work together. Um, I think uh, I, I, one of the disappointments, I think, uh, would be, as we sail off into the future, would be if science does suffer because of change of government um, politically. I think that some of these issues go way beyond, and one of our um, objectives at the moment is to try to get a much longer term approach to science through a science policy, uh, co a Commonwealth science policy, that we would, we would have a strategy behind that and part of the strategy would be to recognise that for most of these big scientific issues you've got to take a long run. You can't just do it tomorrow or say, we'll run a three year terminating program. That was good, it really worked, but the funding's finished now. And that's been what we've, the sort of position we've been in for quite a long time. So um, I, I, would, I would hope that that would be cross party. There's no reason why that should be party political. Some little details of it might be, um, but as a general thing, that ought to be that ought to cross party lines, as it pretty well does in the United States, the United Kingdom, um, uh, different other countries within Europe, Germany, so on. They they, they have an approach where uh, it's it's it, it is much more strategic. The Americans and the uh, Germans, for example, also live with the Federation. They have to work out how to work across levels of government. Um, we do that partially well. Uh, in, in science, the states and territories support science that is of particular relevance to that part. Uh, um, they do it on a much smaller scale in general than the, the Commonwealth would do. I think that's appropriate. Um, the question then is how do we make sure that we're not just dissipating energy through these different mechanisms. And one way, it's not the way, it's not the most important way, but one way is that the various chief scientists get together and talk about these issues as a group two or three times a year. So I think, I think there's, uh, there's uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the way ahead in, with respect to science. I think the government uh, has uh, asked for the um, recommendations that we put forward for a strategy to be fleshed out now. Uh, the Commonwealth Science Council has met, the Prime Minister was there with us for four or five hours all up, including a dinner. Uh, he was actively engaged through that entire period. Uh, the key ministers, education, industry, science and uh, health were there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I feel much more positive about it than I did, say, a year ago. And I guess that that goes back to one of the, one of the things I said earlier, you've got to have patience. You've got to have passion. Uh, and you've got to have persistence, because if you, if you lack any of those Ps, and there are probably a few others too, um, but if you lack any of those, then it just doesn't work. It, it just becomes a stop-start and so on. So persuading them that it's in the long-term interest of the country is bipartisan, cross-party lines, because uh, it's an issue that's important, not a political thing that, that will shift as, as part of the game that, we, that we're engaged in. Thanks very much. We'll close with a, a very quick question and then one quick response. Hi, uh, I'm Apratim. I'm from Department of Health and recently moved from research to APS, like many others in this room. So my feeling is what we have been told by the panel as well, that the policymakers don't really like any uncertainties in decision making or scientific advice. <coughs> but there are uncertainties in the policymaking step itself and policymakers are very happy to take that into the stride, make that value judgment while well, they are more reluctant to take any you know, bifurcation or divided opinion on matters of scientific expertise. So how can we address that? Mm -hmm. We'd like to take that. Well, I don't give quick answers, so I'll hand it over to my colleagues. 
Michael, uh, would you like to tackle it? I'm not sure I fully heard the question, but let me say I think... So, so the question was the um, uh, policymaker tolerance for ambiguity, um, uh, but on the other hand, arguably, less tolerance for um, conflicting views uh, from the science side, and how, how do we bridge that divide and that, that appetite? Yeah. Look, I think that two points that have been made today, particularly by Professor Brian Schmidt, which we need to keep in the forefront of our mind. First, the distinction between advocacy, <coughs> advocacy for science, science funding and then the role of science or the, in more of other policy issues. And uh, so if we're talking about the role of science and other policy issues first, uh, I don't think the science is typically contested. What's contested, and this is the second point of Brian Schmitz, is the difference between, if you like, giving scientific advice about the nature of the problem and the, then the response to the problem. And it's the response to the problem is where the, content, the contestation occurs. And most often, that is not a scientific issue. If, you know, the question of the response to climate change, because you know, the one that's first and, for, first and foremost, is not, is really, you know, uh, do we fund uh, avoidance of mitigation and so on directly from the budget, or do we price the cost of carbon, in, and in which way do we price the cost of carbon? These are not, if for want of a better phrase, scientific questions. Uh, science may help in, uh, in it, but it's not primarily a scientific question. So my point would be that science as science, for the most part, is providing information, and that information is typically not contested. There are examples of a few people who contest the, the science of vaccination or the science of climate change, but my experience is they're in a minority, and I question whether they have much influence on policy. I think if you're talking about the alternative thing, which is uh, you know, how much governments should fund science, <laughs> the difficulty there is that what Ian Chubb referred to is that no one's made, been able to establish a good connection between more or less funding and what we get for our money. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not specific, but there are no. empirical, all the empirical measures show that it has a very high rate of return, but you can't say in advance is what the science minister always says, no, but what are you going to do for me next? And the answer is, it's research. I don't know. That's the whole point. That's, yeah. that, that's really exactly my point, is that scientists make, can't make predictions of that yeah. kind. And I think, Ian, you're chasing a will of the wisp but, uh, to think that you could do better than you did when you were running the vice chancellor's committee. Hmm. Well, I predict that Ian will want the last word. Ian, yeah, well, very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, one of the ways that science can be contested is to argue the results or to ignore it. And, uh, and oftentimes I think, uh, and, and Michael's right, I don't, I don't think we don't contest the science by arguing necessarily the, the, the evidence because you're talking to people who probably don't necessarily understand that evidence at the depth that you would like to uh, talk about. So, so, and then it can be ignored and it's contested in a different way and I think that's the more dangerous way because it's not all out there. You're not actually having the contest robust debate about <coughs> ideas and evidence. You're just saying, well, I don't want that because I've got to do this. So 15% of scientists say that they believe policy choices about land use are guided by the best science. 15%. Now, why is that? It's not that people are arguing about the scientific data, they're just ignoring it. 27% think the best science frequently guides regulations about clean air and water. Why is that? Not because they're contesting the data, they're just ignoring it. 46% think the best science is frequently used in food safety regulations, 46%. So I could extrapolate and say that means 54% of the food you eat is dangerous, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but, I, but I would say that, that what it's actually telling you is that somehow we've actually got to get it looked at differently and, and it comes back, I think, to being persistent and just not having, having what is contested because it's different and pointing a different direction, just ignored. And that's quite different from actually contesting the evidence and the data.
Thanks very much. We've had good conversations and really thoughtful reflections and some great pungent advice. Please join me in thanking our panellists.